America, America, God mend thine every flaw, confirm thy soul in self-control, thy liberty in law. O oh, beautiful for patriot dream that sees beyond the years, thine alabaster cities gleam undimmed by human tears. most epical call to arms and preparedness. Millions of men from 21 to 36 line up and sign up throughout the nation. There's Winthrop Rockefeller, son of John D. Jr. Answer the call to national service. And well, if it isn't Maxie Bear, ready to go into training again. And no kidding. Well, not much. The rodeo stars sign up hoping they don't draw the Iron Cavalry. One of the first young men to register is Warren Pershing, son of our famous wartime commander. All races, creeds, and colors line up for national defense. In Chinatown, the rush is just as great and enthusiastic as elsewhere. Harlem, too, keeps the registrars busy. With the safety of America threatened, all Americans, the humble and the mighty, willingly embrace selective service. From the White House comes a definite promise by the president to those answering their nation's preparedness call. Our present program will train 800,000 additional men this coming year. It is a program, obviously, of defensive preparation and of defensive preparation only. The 16 million young men who register today, I say that democracy is your cause. The cause of youth. From coast to coast, Americans seem more than willing to say goodbye to 1940. In New York, scenes like these on the gay white way are duplicated east side, west side, and all around the town. See out the old year and welcome the new. And do it in style. Forget the war, elections, higher taxes, and that last payment on the car. And brother, greet 1941 with new hopes and new resolutions. Resolutions come tomorrow, along with the headaches. Tonight, it's eat, drink, and be merry. And watch out for those bubbles. America is in a gay and festive mood as the old year slips away. Greeting the new year with renewed hopes and renewed vigor to face whatever comes. Before a joint session of the new Congress, President Roosevelt gives his 1941 message, asking for increased taxes to finance all-out aid for the democracy's fighting aggression. Our most useful and immediate role is to act as an arsenal for them as well as for ourselves. They do not need manpower, but they do need billions of dollars worth of the weapons of defense. The time is near when they will not be able to pay for them all in ready cash. We cannot and we will not tell them that they must surrender merely because of present inability to pay for the weapons which we know they must have. I do not recommend that we make them a loan of dollars with which to pay for these weapons a loan to be repaid 
in dollars, I recommend that we make it possible for those nations to continue to obtain war materials in the United States, fitting their orders into our own program, and nearly all of their material would, if the time ever came, be useful in our own defense. Let us say to the democracy, we Americans are vitally concerned in your defense of freedom. We are putting forth our energies, our resources, and our organizing powers to give you the strength to regain and maintain a free world. We shall send you in ever-increasing numbers, ships, planes, tanks, guns. That is our purpose and our pledge. General de Gaulle, leader of the Free French Forces, inspects French naval vessels now in English ports and soon to go into action against the Axis, side by side with British naval forces. Fine, up-to-date craft, among them a plane-carrying submarine, Proof that the tricolor still waves. Seattle prepares for the first big city blackout test in America. City officials and army officers make and announce complete plans. The streets are made ready for pedestrian safety zones during the blackout, and windows are blackened in key plants. Meanwhile, Mayor Carroll and his board of strategy swings into action. In the streets, thousands of war veterans take their posts as air raid wardens. 10.30. There she goes. From a vantage point overlooking the city, we see the uncanny sight of an entire American city of a third of a million fading into the blackness of the night. Dramatic forewarning of what may happen here. A few citizens don't play ball, but the air raid wardens do their stuff. At nearby Fort Lewis, anti-aircraft units go into action to repel the raiders. America is on guard. One of the most reassuring items on the national defense horizon is the Glen Martin plant. Construction is well underway on a huge new factory to turn out warplanes under a new army contract of $130 million. Meanwhile, work is being rushed on the present plan on production of a new B-26 bomber for Britain and the U.S. Uncle Sam has ordered over a thousand of the new torpedo bombers, which are said to be the most potent air weapon ever designed. Air Corps chiefs ordered production from blueprints, and that's something. Equipped with protective armor, self-sealing gas tanks, power-driven turrets, the B-26 can hit 346 miles an hour, almost as fast as present-day fighter planes. Earlier model Martins are being rushed to England as fast as they come off the assembly line. The B-26s will follow soon. American built eagles are spreading their wings fast. The Army Transport Alexander, once the German liner America, now is a floating barracks at a Newfoundland dock. And here are some of the American troops who are here to guard the new American air and naval bases being built at this critical gateway from Europe. The doughboys up here are getting plenty of winter training, all right. The detachment has a picked platoon of ski troops. And boy, they're ready for business, wind or weather. Here are dramatic pictures of a British attack in Libya. The Italian counter-battery fire is close, but ineffective. Mechanized forces now go into action as planes spot the enemy strongholds. Heavy enemy fire is directed at the tanks, but they plow forward regardless.
now the infantry closes in. Australians they are, and the battle's in the bag. Another Mediterranean port falls to General Wavell's army, plus plenty of prisoners. The British bombing and artillery fire have set fire to oil and other stores. Alert and ready for action, the Australians occupy the town, but find no signs of resistance. Only a few undersized dogs of war left behind. The doghouse they can save for Il Duce. It's another brilliant victory for Wavell's brave Australians. History was made when Henrik de Kaufmann, minister from Denmark, and the United States government signed an agreement permitting the United States to take over the protection of Greenland and to set up air bases and other fortifications there. The Danish government repudiates the agreement, but the United States says it's okay. This agreement between the United States and Denmark relating to the defense of Greenland is by now known to my countrymen in Denmark sitting by their radios under the blackout that covers Denmark now, they will have heard the president's statement. And they will have felt grateful and encouraged when the president expressed his hope for a speedy liberation of Denmark. And they heard the president's assurance that Greenland will remain Danish. In this world of broken treaties, they know the word of the American people and their government can be trusted. It's happened, girls. They're registering girls and drafting them. Girls who work in the federal office buildings in Washington are being signed up as dance partners for the boys in nearby army camps. Not by the scores, but by the hundreds. And it's all very official. The first batch, or should I say bevy, is drawn from a regular draft board fishbowl. And how they hate it. The idea is to make the stay of selectees at camps around Washington a pleasant one. And brother, they certainly are going about it the right way. What a war, what a war. What will you bet that exemption claims don't drop? Civilian workers at the Washington Navy Yard now carry gas masks. They never know when a gas mask drill alarm will be sounded. That alarm means put on masks, stop machines, and get outside as fast as possible. There's nothing like being prepared. Out at Fort Ord, California, gas masks for horses are now a part of the regular training. Specially made masks that have been proven to be excellent protection for animals during gas attacks. Regular drills through gas and smoke clouds accustom the horses to these strange, oatless nose bags. Men of the 501st Parachute Battalion, Uncle Sam's first chute jumping unit are seasoned cloud men now. From a platoon of 50, the battalion has had mushroom growth in the last few months to a total of 450 officers and men. You are now about to see a spectacular demonstration of their ability and daring. This scene in slow motion shows how the first few seconds must drag out to the men jumping. A total of 70 men are bailing out one after another. The greatest mass jump ever made in the United States. The 501st Battalion will soon be divided to form the beginning of three or four more battalions. It takes nerve and daring, all right. And when the men are well-trained, landing is as easy as falling off a log. Malta, Great Britain's island fortress and naval base in the Mediterranean, is a sharp thorn in the side of the Axis partners. They're used to bombing here. They've bombed almost every day. But here's one day they'll long remember. The Axis bombing raid, the worst in months, left a huge toll in casualties and wreckage. Fresh from the greatest naval victory in modern times off Cape Matapan, 
British warships are triumphantly back at their base. In a knockdown, drag out fight with a sizable section of the Italian fleet, brought to bay by British naval bombers, the British sank at least three cruisers and two destroyers and crippled a battleship. Now, under their noted commander, Admiral Cunningham, they're all loaded up and ready for another go at the Italian fleet, or what's left of it. This will give you an idea of the tough country the British troops of Wavell's army tackled in their drive. With indomitable courage, they drove the Italians foot by foot from their position, supposed to be impregnable. Casualties are high, but the haul in prisoners is immense. The war is over for that bunch, and I'll bet some of them aren't a bit sorry. Once over the hill, Cherin, the goal of the British advance, is quickly taken. It is the key to Asmara and the coast. Few important buildings in the town were damaged. The day's work by the British probably has given the Duce himself a terrific pain in the axis. Prime Minister Winston Churchill goes out to see for himself whether there's any unrest among the long-suffering English people. And the reception he gets is ample proof to him that he is even more popular than ever as their war leader. Furthermore, he finds that they are far from downhearted, despite the continual bombings they have undergone. It's the most welcome vote of confidence he has ever received, right from the heart of the people. The ill-starred Vichy government of France, yielding to pressure from Germany and Japan, has granted almost complete military control to Japan and French Indochina. And already, thousands of Japanese troops have moved in. Thailand, too, is threatened. But the major threat is against Singapore. War in the Pacific looms closer than ever before. President Roosevelt has frozen all Japanese assets in the United States. And, as the Emperor of Japan calls a million more men to the colors, with the Japanese war party well in the saddle, more economic curbs on Japan by the United States and Britain are daily expected. Japan is moving troops and planes and warships to the East Indian danger zone. Meanwhile, the Dutch have banned oil exports to Japan. On every side, flames are licking at the Oriental powder barrel. In the most bizarre and astounding event of the war so far, Rudolf Hess, number three Nazi, seen here going about his activities as confidant and chief party leader for the Nazi warlord Hitler, is now a prisoner in Scotland after a mysterious solo flight from Germany. Unarmed, he was captured by a farmer after bailing out when his gas supply ran low. A mysterious trip that has the whole world guessing. The Nazi leader took off from Augsburg and headed straight for Western Scotland, where an old friend of his, the Duke of Hamilton, has an estate. His mission? Who knows? Perhaps a plan for peace, perhaps an escape from personal enemies or impending events in the Reich. Germany says he has lost his mind. Britons think the fantastic trip may be a Nazi ruse, a Trojan horse of another color. When he was found with his parachute after his plane had crashed, Hess said his trip was made to save humanity. The Army puts on its show of shows in the Northwest. Troops of the 9th Army Corps demonstrate all phases of preparedness for thousands of assembled friends and relatives, as well as for various general officers, governors, and other dignitaries. There's no hush-hush business about bayonet practice these days, the boys get right down to the fine points of who's going to be stuck if trouble starts. The highlight of the day is a monster parade and review of the entire Army Corps, 45,000 strong before Lieutenant General DeWitt, commander of the 4th Army.
made up of the famous 3rd and 41st Divisions, the 9th Corps is ready for business. And how? The USS Drum, 35th submarine built at the Portsmouth Naval Yard, slides down the ways after christening by Mrs. Thomas Holcomb, wife of the Marine Corps Commandant. Authorized in 1934, the new undersea craft will soon join our expanding first line of defense, the greatest sea drama of the war. Torpedo plane from the British carrier Ark Royal head for the Nazi raider Bismarck as British warships close in on the fleeing battleship. The chase gets hotter as speedy planes report the enemy's position. At forced draft, the great warships plunge ahead to bring the foe to bay so as to avenge the sinking of the hood. There's the Renown hurrying in to join in the fight. Crippled by torpedo planes, the Bismarck, there in the distance, is being battered into a hulk, soon to go out of sight. After victory comes celebration on the British ships, including the carrier Victorious, which got in on the fight, and the Norfolk with its lucky mascot. Rodney, with the renown, did most of the heavy work in the battle and has proof of it in her blistered gun barrels. The Dorsetshire finished off the Bismarck with a torpedo. And here are the Bismarck survivors being landed in England. A bare handful lived through the terrific pounding that warship took. Many of those saved came through without a scratch, but not all of them. But for the entire group, the war is over. In port, the First Lord of the Admiralty, A.V. Alexander, is piped aboard to congratulate and praise the British officers and men who won the dramatic and epical victory. In a sudden coup, Germany's military might has been thrown against her former ally, Russia, in a gigantic attack by land as well as by air, along a 2,000-mile front from the Arctic to the Black Sea. Aided by Romania on the south and Finland on the north, the Nazis have thrust six powerful drives into Soviet territory. It's the strangest turn yet in this war of surprises. Russia betrayed Germany's trust in her, announced von Ribbentrop, but the great Nazi need for grain and other food products of the Russian Ukraine, as well as Russian oil fields in preparation for a long war, may be behind the sudden turnabout. Russia, with its millions under arms, is not a weak and defenseless nation and is hurling her troops, tanks, and planes to the threatened points. But early reports indicate that the fury of the German attack is carrying deep into red territory. But the Nazis have perfected this new war terror. It was Russia's non-aggression pact with Germany two years ago that set the stage for the war. But now, Russia finds herself an overnight ally of Britain. What effect the recent Soviet-Japanese friendship pact will have on the situation is a mystery. Three quarters of the world is now at war. At the Soviet Embassy, the Ambassador Konstantin Omansky makes a formal statement on this world-shaking turn of events. Hitler has miscalculated. Ours is a nation of a moral and political unity and strength unknown in the past. It is firmly organized, devoted to its leaders, and has utmost confidence in its armed forces which are ready for any test. Hitler's attack against my country will be smashed. With Great Britain now calling for all aid to Russia, Under Secretary of State Wellis tells the press that the administration, while condemning the Nazi attack, 
has not yet considered plans for lease lend aid to Russia. Secretary of Navy Knox conducts the ceremonies that mark the second draft drawing. The secretary chooses a selectee from the previous draft, Staff Sergeant Robert Shackleton of Fort Dix, to pick the first number from the famous goldfish bowl. The lottery will determine the order number of 750,000 who have reached their 21st birthday since the last draft. Another step toward the deferment of older selectees. Ex-heavyweight champ Gene Tunney, uh, pardon me, Lieutenant Commander James J. Tunney of the U.S. Navy is making rough, tough, and rugged men out of the Navy's new recruits. A two-mile run before breakfast? It's just an appetizer. Tunney has worked out a complete system of physical training for the Navy, five weeks of it, and has been put in charge of the entire program. His system stresses developing stomach muscles. Yes, sir. After five weeks of this kind of workout, the boy should be able to do anything and eat anything, even iron rations. 87 flying cadets receive commissions as second Louis in the Army Air Forces. Handpicked from various training centers throughout the country, they've completed instruction in pursuit flying here at Mitchell Field. They'll help protect East Coast cities from aerial attack. Tobruk Harbor is a graveyard of wrecked ships, warships, and supply ships, Italian and British. But not far away, in and around the heat-baked Libyan port, British and Australian troops are writing a bright chapter in the dramatic history of war. Six months ago, they took it, and for six months, the do-or-die garrison has held on against Axis attacks, repairing their equipment from the enemy's wrecked tanks and trucks scattered hereabouts, and making the best of life in the besieged town. Mail call brings a thrill, news of a baby in far-off Australia, and the lucky father's buddies promptly give him the works, even to a loving cup taking care of a thousand pound bomb that failed to explode is no sinecure. And live thermite bombs are tricky playthings too, as you can tell from the cameraman's caution. A fellow can't even take a bath without the blooming Nazi starting a fracas. Hundreds of German and Italian tanks and other combat vehicles have been knocked off by British guns and dive bombers in the many attacks on the desert stronghold. British raiding parties also take their toll of enemy lives and equipment. Great numbers of Nazi and Italian prisoners have fallen into the hands of the heroic garrison, including many German tank crew members. Enemy planes approaching, and they're Nazi bombers, only to get a British supply ship in the harbor. They got her that time. The sailors on board jump for their lives as the ship quickly goes to the bottom. What a sight! A ringside seat at one of the most spectacular events in the Battle of the Mediterranean. Anti-aircraft guns down several of the bombers while the sailors get ashore safely to carry on in the dramatic siege of Tobruk. Cordell Hull, American Secretary of State, had used every means at his disposal to check Japanese aggression. In November 1941, Americans hoped that his efforts were meeting with success. When the Japanese sent Saburo Karusu, a special envoy, by plane to Washington. But Karusu's trip was only a smokescreen. With the European powers locked in a war of survival, America's Pacific fleet is the major obstacle to Japanese domination of Asia and the Pacific. The ruling militarists hatch a fateful plan to eliminate the obstacle. Sink the United States Navy.
guns are sighted on Pearl Harbor, the key to America's defense in the Pacific, the headquarters of the United States Pacific Fleet. Japan knows the attack she is planning means war. But if she sinks the principal striking force of the United States Navy, the prize is worth the risk. Such bold designs demand hard study and exact intelligence. The Hawaiian Islands are scrutinized, especially Oahu, with its principal targets. Honolulu, Pearl Harbor, the major airfields, installations of every kind, forts, naval bases, warehouses, dry docks. Every military factor of importance is pinpointed for the coming attack. In early November, Admiral Yamamoto, designer of the Pearl Harbor attack, orders his striking force to advance into Hawaiian waters and upon the very opening of hostilities, attack the main force of the United States fleet. A week later, the Pearl Harbor striking force is assembled and weighs anchor for Hawaii, 4,000 miles and 12 days away. The task force maintains radio silence and travels a roundabout course off normal shipping lanes. Dirty weather and heavy seas help veil its progress. never before been so powerful a striking force in the Pacific. Two fast battleships, six of Japan's newest and finest carriers, a screen of eight destroyers, three cruisers and three submarines. Aboard the carriers are 40 torpedo bombers, 135 dive bombers, 104 horizontal bombers, and 81 strafing planes. A total of 360 aircraft. Latitude, 26 degrees north. Longitude, 158 degrees west. The launching point. Pearl Harbor lies 275 miles to the south. It is 0600. It is X day. thousand miles away in Washington, it is almost noon. At the Navy Department, intelligence experts have had a puzzling Sunday morning. Some time ago, they broke Japan's most carefully guarded code. They've deciphered a dispatch from Tokyo to the Japanese Embassy. Secret instructions reject America's request for mediation in the Far Eastern crisis. Order negotiations broken off. Exactly what this means, no one knows. State Department is uneasy. Secretary Cordell Hull awaits another crucial conference with the Japanese ambassador and a special envoy from Tokyo scheduled for one o'clock. The Japanese ask for a 45-minute postponement. But there is no delay in the flight of their warplanes toward Hawaii. weather good, visibility clear, slowly life begins to stir on the island. radar station, a private practices as he waits for the breakfast truck. 
He picks up planes approaching from the north and tracks them for a few minutes before reporting to Air Force Headquarters, Hickam Field. But the planes are thought to be American. Ten minutes to eight. December 7th, 1941.
pilots and the planes depart. Never in modern history has a war begun with so smashing a victory. In one hour and 50 minutes, the Japanese have sunk or shattered eight battleships. Oklahoma, West Virginia, Arizona, Nevada, California, Tennessee, Maryland, Pennsylvania. Three cruisers and three destroyers, and four smaller ships are sunk or battered. and most of their hangars demolished. America has been attacked without warning. That's the dramatic, the almost fantastic news that Presidential Secretary Early tells the press. And throughout the nation, the news is flashed. It's war, American lives lost, American property destroyed. With growing resentment, Americans learn of the treacherous assault. We didn't start this war, but we can finish it. A wave of patriotic emotion sweeps across the nation. In our greatest hour of peril, a new unity and resolve binds us together. All leaves canceled, troops called back into uniform. But meanwhile, in the far off Pacific, Guam has been attacked by Jap ships in planes. It's reported almost destroyed. Wake Island, another stepping stone to our Far East possessions has been attacked. Jap forces have also raided Singapore, Hong Kong, Thailand, the Philippines. Jap troops have established footholds on the Malay Peninsula. American sailors return to battle stations, men for our great Navy, now facing the long-awaited test in the Pacific. They're ready for action in the fighting tradition of our great Navy. Immediately following the savage attack at Pearl Harbor, fleet units set out in pursuit of the raiders. The Jap carrier that slipped through with its deadly cargo has been sunk. Several submarines have been destroyed, and our battle fleet has made contact with the enemy west of Hawaii. There's work ahead. A grim job for men and ships of our Navy, and a job for all of us at home. Now is the time for Americans to forget past differences, to work with renewed strength for the victory that will surely be ours. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. The facts of yesterday and today speak for themselves. With confidence in our armed forces, with the unbounding determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph, so help us God. Here's a sight you never saw before. Times Square being literally cleared in a few moments on a busy day. The answer, of course, is that there's an air raid warning test. When you clean off Times Square as well as they've done today, that's doing something, brother. Police and volunteer wardens deserve great praise, of course. But the greatest praise goes to old John Q. Public and his family, who've been playing ball all the way. It's serious business. Loyal American-born Japanese on the West Coast are quick to make their positions clear. They're all out for America, they say. Meanwhile, coast cities are on the alert. Precautions against air attack are far-reaching and speedily done. They're taking no chances. 
America is really on guard now. We're getting up steam for an all-out victory.